movies. Oh, yeah, party peoples. It's Bobbo here with Brass Real Brothers. Thanks for coming back for some more Brass Real tonight, where we talk about everything coming out to the big screen, everything coming out at home to stream, and all the shenanigans going on behind the scenes. What up? How y'all doing? How's life treating y'all? Good? It's going well for me. Had some uh, little bit of news today, but not anything crazy. But, you know, always something going on in the news, whether it's super interesting stuff about an actor getting a role, or whether it's super good shit about, uh, you know, some nasty stuff going on behind the scenes, any of that stuff, always something. It's not crazy today. Actually, a lot of horror stuff. It's kind of why I got my Chucky shirt on here. I don't know if y'all can see that. Yeah, it's all like old school and green and red. Love that little it hat right here. Beautiful. I should have, damn, I should have got my Jason and Freddie mugs out, but instead I still got the Batman swell. But such a great drinker. And anyways, nothing, nothing crazy, crazy. I didn't see anything last night. We do have some good stuff coming out this weekend. Free Guy is coming up. Kind of really excited to see that movie. Um, I love Ryan Reynolds. I don't think that he's definitely, you know, fallen off the map or anything yet. He has kind of stuck to sort of the Deadpool. And then this free guy thing does look good. He did Detective Pikachu, but he wasn't really in that. He just talked in it. Hey, what up, Maz Maniac? How you doing, buddy? Thanks. Appreciate that. Thanks for the compliment. But anyways, the new movie Free Guy is supposed to be pretty good. It's getting some good reviews. They're saying the plot line is a little little eh, not like it's bad but apparently ryan reynolds is great the entire time and i think it is sort of like this humanistic approach to a storyline something that's supposed to be real heartfelt so i think you're really supposed to care about ryan the whole movie rather than the plot i think the plot is sort of secondary it's getting good reviews so i'm excited about it i think it'll be pretty good and then don't breathe too that's coming out this weekend, which that's the one I'm really excited about. We're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. But luckily, we don't have any any like bad news to report today as far as someone getting sick or we us losing a you know a celebrity to, to death or anything like that. So today it's it's going to be just up and coming stuff. So that's good. I like that. But let's get rolling though, guys. We'll start it off quick. Oh, first off, I do want to tell y'all though. If, if you can't comment on the live show and there's something you want to talk to me about or anything like that, go to BrassLittleBobby at gmail.com, send in some topics, whatever. If you got something that you some questions about, you think I might know the answer, or if you just want me to discuss it, have some fun with it. So just send it to BrassLittleBobby at gmail.com. If you can't comment on the show itself, like I said, I know I got, I know I got one person watching right now or listening. So hell yeah, that's something. One of these days though, like I said, I'm going to be up there with the greats, Carson. Letterman, Conan. <laughs> That's my little fun joke. Big news. Suicide Squad is all on the news right now, even though it's not doing that well. But because of Idris Elba. And, you know, Idris Elba has really gotten up there in his status. I like Idris Elba. In fact, my buddy is as maniac. He's always said that he thought he was OK, but he liked him in the Suicide Squad. I've always liked him. I liked him in Prometheus. I love him in the Thor franchise. Almost anything that I see him in, I think he's cool. And I just enjoy his acting on screen. Well, he's just signed on for the new Sonic movie to be Knuckles. He is Knuckles in the new Sonic the Hedgehog 2 movie. If you guys don't know who Knuckles is, I'm sure you, you do. But if you're any uh, 80s or 90s kids out there, Sega, when it was a big deal, Sonic the Hedgehog was huge. And obviously that Sonic the Hedgehog movie came out. But Knuckles... For people like me, Knuckles is what I really loved about the game. I thought Knuckles was super cool. He was hilarious. He he was sort of like, if you ever watched Scooby-Doo, then when Scrappy-Doo came along, the uncle, and he was like a little bit more mouthy, and he was just the darker version of Scooby-Doo. I've always liked that, and anytime they do that with characters, like as soon as they made the dark symbiote Spider-Man, I was obsessed with it. I loved it. So I'm excited that we're going to get Idris doing Knuckles. I think he's got the personality for it. You definitely saw his quick wit and how he was kind of a smart ass in, in Suicide Squad. So that was cool. I was, I'm, like I said, excited for him to just do this. He, obviously, he's not going to be the character himself. He's just going to be uh, the voice of it. I'm curious if he's going to do his accent or not. One of the things that I remember even as Maniac commenting on that 
he actually liked that he didn't change his accent in the Suicide Squad. Because your son movies, like if you see him in Prometheus, he's got like a Southern accent. Which I'm not sure why they made that choice. Maybe they wrote the character that way. And then Idris came in and said, hey, I can do this. Check it out. So maybe that's, you know, why he changed it up. I'm not sure if, he, I think if I remember correctly, Knuckles is supposed to, like, because they made cartoons out of the Sonic franchise. Because in the, in the games, they didn't talk. In the games, they, they were just there. But in the franchise, or excuse me, in the cartoon, they I think they had to talk. And if I remember correctly, Knuckles had almost kind of like a a New York smart ass accent or something like that, like a Brooklyn accent. I could be wrong, but I'm just curious to see what they're going to go with with this. And and recently he just posted this. Idris Elba himself posted a picture of this, which is pretty cool. He, it was on his Twitter, just posting this little thing. And on the top of it, on the Twitter itself, he, he wrote knock knock because Knuckles, you know. So that's pretty sweet, <laughs> pretty clever. We'll see. I enjoyed, for what it was worth, I enjoyed the first Sonic movie. It was a little too childish for me. I would have, I would have rather them, them aired on the side of mixing the the childish with the adult stuff. But like James Marsden and Jim Carrey, which they were great. James Jim Carrey is fantastic. He was really good as that role. They definitely went for the childish route a little more. So I'm hoping that that's. I mean, I'm sure they're going to do that again, but I'd really like if it if it actually went a little more to the adult role, or just mixed it up a little bit, kind of like Pixar does. Like you, you don't have to go full on wacky, cartoon stunt childish. You know, like things like where people are falling off the side of a building or something like that, and they they land and they're like, oh, hmm, that hurt. It's like that was something that would have killed them. And I just hope they don't go those routes like that. I'd I'd rather them keep it a little bit of a as grounded as you can be in a Sonic the Hedgehog movie, but just not go over the top cartoony. That's all I'm saying. Anyways, other news. This is just something that I thought was interesting because everybody knows about this, especially if you're in a Hollywood, if you're into the news, if you're just, even if you're not into Hollywood, you knew this was going on when it was happening. But just, just as of 20, 30, 40 minutes ago, it was announced that he is going to be the New York, let's see, Andre Brower is cast as a New York Times editor, Dean Baquette, in the Weinstein investigation film called She Said. Now, there's nothing really in-depth about what's ha- like happening with the full-on, I think they're focusing more on the women that were the victims that accused him. And, and again, we're totally, that guy's a dirtbag, Harvey Weinstein. But I know, if you're like me, everybody is interested in seeing what happens with I want to see some story. We knew it was inevitable that this movie was going to get made at some point. I mean, it's the Weinstein story. I'm curious to see who's going to play Harvey Weinstein and just how they, if he's going to have any role in the movie at all, or if we're just going to see him in the courtroom or something, you know what I mean? Or if it's going to be like news clippings or something. I don't know. I'm just curious to see who they're going to have to play. I don't know if you guys ever saw the Curb Your Enthusiasm episode with, because Jeff Garland is I think it's his name in Jeff it's Jeff Green or Jeff Garland. So he's I think he's Jeff Green on the show, but Jeff Garland is his name in real life. Hilarious. He's the dad on Goldbergs, which I love that show. It's all based out of the 80s and everything. But there the first episode of the 10th season is hilarious. He's walking into this party and all these people are looking at him and they're like, you dirtbag. And he looks almost identical to Harvey Weinstein. And they play that up in the plot of the show. It's super funny. And if you look at him, you're like, oh, my God, dude, you do look like Harvey Weinstein. And I just I think it's awesome how they instead of them being like, oh, great, I look like this dude. They just ran with it, made fun with it and put it into the show. Hilarious. But anyways, I'm curious to see that movie. I think that everybody's definitely curious to see what's up with that movie. And I just want we knew it was inevitable. We knew it was going to happen. As Maniac just said, like Pryor on the skis and Superman. What are you referring to? I know, I know what you referred to, like Pryor on the ski. I know Superman three, but like, what are you referring with that comment towards? I'm not sure. I'm, I ramble so much. I when I'm talking half the time, and this is my whole life, I'll be talking about something and I'll just be moving on so quick. Sometimes I'll forget about what I was talking about. So um, forgive me if I do that. Sometimes I just I talk. I'm a talker. 
and we're all indoors all the time now. It's it, it's hard to like, it's bottled up. So when you actually start talking to somebody on the phone or somebody's in person with you, I find myself just having chronic diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> My dad used to say that. Um. Oh yeah, exactly. Okay, you like falling from the building. You mentioned earlier, like I was talking about making movies cartoony. And people falling off and they're just like, oh, brushing it off like it's no problem. Exactly. That's exactly what I was talking about. And that's kind of what they did with the, the Sonic the Hedgehog, the first movie. So I just want them to get, there's a way to make that childlike nostalgic things in film. It's a, There's a way to make that not childish in the movie to where you can watch it when you're 30 or 40 and, and still enjoy it to a degree. You know, to me, one of the perfect examples of that is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. There's so many adult sexual innuendo moments in Roger Rabbit and so many other just jokes, but they fly completely over kids' head. But the entire time, it's so much fun when they're watching that movie because it's it's just perfectly geared towards kids and adults. And you can watch it 30, 40 years later. I can rewatch Roger, Roger Rabbit right now. It's a great film. It just works on so many levels. Anyways. <laughs> not going to get too far off on that again. This is another little bit of news that I'm just curious about. So John Lithgow just joined the cast of Martin Scorsese's new film called the killers of the flower moon. And look, this guy, not only is it him in it, but it's already got Leonardo DiCaprio in there. It's got Jesse Plemons and then Brendan Fraser, believe it or not, just joined the cast, which is funny to me. I'm trying to pour this, pull this article up, but it's not one. To, there we go. Now it's changing. Um, yeah, there's one other person in it, but yeah, uh, De Niro also. That's the other one. So it's DiCaprio, De Niro, Plemons, and Brendan Fraser, which is interesting to me. I mean, he is a good actor, but it's just interesting that he landed that role. And then now John Lithgow. So, hey, that's going to be pretty cool. John Lithgow is an excellent actor. He's coming back for the Dexter reunion, which I'm excited about that along with Jennifer Carpenter as Deb because the Dexter, I've talked about this before. Awesome show last season. Yes, it was, it was, a, they dropped the ball on that, but as a whole, that show is phenomenal in my opinion. And so John Lithgow looks like his careers. I mean, I don't think his career has ever gone anywhere, but man, in the, Scors in the Scorsese film, that's awesome. Now I do have to say this. I'm hoping, I'm not sure what, what conduit they're going to go through with releasing this film. I, I mean, I don't think that Scorsese has a Netflix contract, but I, what I'm not wanting is another Irishman. Look, yes, the acting was good in it. Yes, there were moments that were cool, but it was way too long. It was kind of boring, if you ask me. I, I don't know. Not his best work. I don't like all the de-aging and everything. In my opinion, it's like, why didn't you just use other actors? I mean... Look, I love Scorsese. Wolf of Wall Street is my favorite movie by him. So I think it's cool that him and De Niro are going to be in something together like this. That's going to be awesome. And Lithgow joining the crew, that, that's not going to hurt. You know, I, I say it just like uh, John Campia says it. It's never never a mistake adding talent to, to, to projects like this. But, you know, Martin Scorsese's got his stuff figured out. He knows what he wants in his movies. He's a very specific director. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to it. I think that let me see if there's a plot synopsis on here about this. Um, it no, I mean I'm not seeing it. I mean it is. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really seeing the full on plot synopsis of this this article. This is just him joining the the cast of it. But I'm always going to watch a Scorsese film, no matter what. I got to. I mean, he's a legend. He's one of the guys. I mean, there's there's like five to ten directors that you know. That's a maybe seven to ten directors that are just in the gold status. You know, Spielberg, obviously one of them. Scorsese's one of them. There's not a ton. Cameron's one of them. There's not a ton of people. Spike Jones or Spike Lee is one of them. There's not a ton of people that you can just look at and be like, all right, Ridley Scott's one of them. So Scorsese's new movie, I'm always going to watch it, no matter what. Moving on to some horror news, though. This is exciting for me. Don Mancini's Chucky. It's finished shooting. It's done, y'all. 
wrapped production. Now that doesn't mean that it's ready to air. That just means that it's wrapped production. That's going to be awesome. Now this is something that I can't believe that they did. And I forgot to download these pictures of this and put this in the stream, but they may have released this a while back. I just didn't realize that they were doing it like this. I knew that Brad Dourif was returning. All, all knew that Brad Dourif was returning for it as the voice of Chucky. He is the voice of Chucky. And man, see, here we go. This, uh, I'm sorry, guys. My computer is just, all of a sudden, it's it's fine. And then all of a sudden, it just runs super slow. Just trying to pull up this article. Hmm. But Brad Dourif is returning, and not only is Brad Dourif returning, but they have Fiona Dourif, which is his daughter, and she played Nika Pierce, and then Alex Vincent as Andy Barclay. He's the original kid in the original movie, and then Christine Elise, I think is her name, she's going to be playing, she was Kyle in part two. They're all returning, along with Jennifer Tilly and Brad Dourif, which those are the voices of the two dolls, Chucky and his girl. I'm just... This is awesome. Alex Vincent did return for the last two Chucky movies, see, uh, Cult of Chucky and Curse of Chucky. And he, it's, again, the same kid that played him in the original movies, playing him now, the same character, which is pretty cool. I mean, he's all grown up now and everything. And the daughter was the main character of the Curse of Ch Chucky, and she was in Cult of Chucky, but she wasn't the main character. But it's all really tied together, and Don Mancini is going to direct the first episode. He's not directing all of the episodes, just the first one which that's fine. I think it's cool to get other people's take on some episodes and some episodes lend themselves sometimes in series to a different theme. So they don't necessarily have to just keep that same director. If they're going for, you know, an episode that's an exposition episode where you're really learning about like, like a middle of the season episode or something where you're really learning a lot, you know, a lot of times they'll bring somebody that's a dialogue heavy director that's used to dialogue and stuff like that. And then if it's going to be a, an episode where it's like, Hey, this is a pivotal episode. This is like episode nine and some, some true shit goes down and where some killings happen. And we really want to make this one bloody and horrific. Then they're going to probably bring, bring in a, a director that gets on the darker sides of slashers and stuff like that. But Don Mancini is the guy who created the character and him directing the first episode. It's like Sam Raimi directing the first episode of Ash versus evil dead, lay the foundation, show them kind of what you should do, give them the playground to play in, and then take it on your own areas here and there. And they do that with most shows. Very rarely do they have one person just directing an entire series. Sometimes that does happen, though. It happened with How I Met Your Mother, the new Wednesday show coming out that's directed by, by Tim Burton on Netflix, the Adams Family Show. That's a that's a good you know example of somebody directing the entire series. You said, as Maniac says, he watched the trailer. Is Brad back? Get Chris Sarandon back after and a gutter. Again, I'm sorry. Oh, you're talking about Chucky. Nope, Sarandon is not back. Um, and Brad is back. Yes, Brad is back as Chucky. He's been on confirmed as that. If John, Man if Don Mancini is going to be doing any sort of Chucky stuff, Brad Dorf is going to be the voice. I don't mind that they changed it up in the last remake with Mark Hamill. That was cool because that was its own new version of side version of Chucky. This one is continuing on from the first movie, the second movie, third, the legacy of Chucky that's existed this entire time without the remake. This one's continuing on from all of those. They're not erasing anything. They're just keeping going. So, and like I said, Jennifer Tilly's back as well. So that's dope. Also, the new trailer for the new Nicolas Cage movie came out today. Oh, my God. It's called The Prisoners of Ghostland. I don't even know how to describe this movie. I mean, it's nuts. No question about that. It is nuts. But it's so I'll, I'll read you the synopsis here. In the treacherous frontier of a samurai town, a ruthless bank robber, Nicolas Cage, is sprung from jail by a wealthy warlord who's played by Bill Mosley. He's adopted a granddaughter, Bernice. She's gone missing. The governor offers the, prison his, the prisoner his freedom in exchange for retrieving the runaway. Strapped into a leather suit that will self-destruct in five days, the bandit sets off on a journey to find the young woman and his own path to redemption. So, all right. 
look, Cage is the man. I don't care what anybody says. I think Cage is awesome. He can he can do whatever he wants. And if he fails, no big deal. I'll just watch him in his next ones because most of the time he puts out something every like every three, four films that's just like, damn, that was badass. Like Mandy, I love that. And from what I understand, Pig is getting really good reviews. Like festivals are wanting to show it now and, and, and air it against other things to get awards. So that's just to show you that Nick still has what it takes. Now, seeing like the picture right here of it, doesn't that just get you excited? Look at him. He's got what, like a sawed off shotgun and he's just screaming straight up Nicolas Cage style. I'm all about it. And yes, I think as Maniac says, will Cage have dialogue? Yes, I think he will have dialogue. This is not one of those stupid ass movies like Willy Wonderland. Look, I didn't think Willy Wonderland was terrible, but it was a disappointment to me. I was I was ready to see him just go like I, the way they showed him in the preview, he was like cleaning stuff all swiftly and like swinging around and dancing and everything. To me, I was just like, oh, this is going to be a, a role of a lifetime for Nick. And then he, you see him in in the movie itself, and it's like, wait a minute, you don't talk? What the? I, I don't know. That was just <laughs> a disappointment to me. Part of part of the allure to Nick Cage to me is how crazy he is and how his dialogue and just how off the charts he starts behaving. That's what to me works. Not that he can't do soft spoken roles and stuff like that. Obviously he can, but in a movie called Willie's Wonderland about these animatronic dolls that come to life at a Chuck E. Cheese type establishment, I need to see him talk. I, you know, the fact that he showed up just wasn't talking that to me. It was just like, why'd y'all make that choice? I didn't get it. Who knows? There could have been a reason behind it. It could have been because they were like, let's put this movie together. Let's do it crazy. And we got Nick Cage, but we need to start shooting. All right. He has no lines. Sometimes stuff like that happens on movies. And that's the decision they go with. Yeah. It just plays pinballs on his uh, pinball on his brakes. I mean, that's that's a cool part of the character, but how cool would it have been if he played pinball on his brakes and then he started like being a, a, like talking shit while he's playing pinball? I mean, that'd be awesome. That would add to, to an awesome character. It's like, oh, you don't want to see this guy get mad when he plays pinball, the things that come out of his mouth. Like, that's, that's a great idea right there. But you can't do anything if he's not talking. He just plays pinball. That's boring. Anyways, I mean, I'm excited about it, though. I mean, I think I think anything, you know, Prisoners of Ghostland is what it's called. I think it's going to be good. The trailer looks dope, so I say check that out. But speaking of trailers, the full-on trailer came out to this one today. Sorry, wrong graphic there. The full-on trailer came out to this one. The last matinee, oh, my God, does it look awesome. Now, like I, like I said, this is a Jalo film. A straight, They're calling it a neo-Jalo slasher. And I said this the other day, but I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more. If you guys, Jalo is a genre that is just super, it's a, just, it's a beloved genre that is pretty much love or hate. You either are like, nope, they don't do it for me. Or you're like me where I love them. It's like an addiction. Like I went, and, and most people do this. Most people, when they get into Jalo films and it finally hits them, they finally see one that's like, why does that? hit me like that why does it connect with me why is it so weird and artistic but also gruesome and there's always hot women but it's like it's just then you'll go on a run or you'll go on a roll and you'll binge giallo films for like two three months that's what i did and that's what most people usually do with giallo for because it's like that it's it's opening this new window into a subgenre of horror that you didn't know existed and it almost in this weird way feels like you're in another world I don't know if that's a, a way to explain it or if you if you see what I'm saying, but kind of the way Stanley Kubrick does. And like if when you watch The Shining and you're you're walking through that hotel, it's like you're in another world. It's like you're it's so hypnotic and it's so mesmerizing when you're walking in there that it almost doesn't. When I say another world, I don't mean like on another planet. I'm talking about like it's it, it is Earth and whatever, but it just it's just sort of like not the earth we know or something. It just feels a little off. Like you're in another world somehow. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm getting off on a tangent, but that, but that's what I like about Jalo films. And this new trailer looks freaking dope. 
And uh, as Maniac, you're asking what movie I'm talking about. I'm talking about the last matinee. This is the this is the poster of it, just without the title of the movie, because the poster I found I couldn't fit it on here right. And so the poster is actually this, but then the title of the movie at the bottom that says Last Matinee. And man, it just, if you like Suspiria, to me, I've said this the other day, Suspiria is great. And a lot of people know Suspiria as like one of the best Giallo films. And it is, it's awesome. It's an amazing film. But to me, it gets all the love. I think Tenebrae is the one where it's at. Tenebrae to me is like, all right, that, to me, is the epitome of Jallo. And Jallo is, yeah, like, like as Maniac says, like Kubrick's carpets and artistic imagination. That's how the Jallo films are. They, like, the always the homes and the apartments or who, whatever they live in, just what they're using, the, the kitchens. That are, like, there's this one scene in Tenebrae where this guy's coming out on the side of her window and she gets her arm chopped off and she's, like, in this room and her arm's, like, chopped off, like, right, like, from right here. And she's like, ah, and like screaming around and everything. It's like this white wall. She's wearing white and just the blood is spraying everywhere. And it's, it's awesome. And I know that sounds super sadistic, but you'll see what I mean. If you watch it, like if you hadn't seen Tenebrae, you guys, and you like horror films, and especially if you like Jallo films, you got to see Tenebrae. Tenebrae is awesome. It's even got John Saxon in it from Nightmare on Elm Street. And John Saxon, he's been in tons of stuff. I mean, he was in Quentin Tarantino movies. He's been in old school movies with John Wayne. I mean, he's done everything. But I know him from Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, he's goodness. And I said this before about Jallo films. Jallo films are ironically, cheesily um, charming. They always overdub stuff. But a lot of times, it's not overdub. Like, John Saxon's in there. And he's speaking fully English. You could see it and everything. And then somebody's talking to him speaking Italian, but it's an English overdub. And they do that all the time with Jallo. It's almost like part of it. And I like that. At first, it can seem a little distracting, but then you start to realize that there's something charming about that. It, it sort of adds to it a little bit. But the soundtracks are always awesome. Like the like Suspiria and a lot of the Dario Argento films, Deep Red and all that. There's a group called Goblin. It's an, it's like a rock band, but they did all the music for those movies, a lot of them. And the music is just so 70s slash 80s horror movie music. It's just, it's dope. It's it's such a romantic horror movie genre, if that makes sense. And I don't mean that, like it's a rom the romantic movies. It's just a, it's very, it's Italian. It's artistically done. I just, I don't know any way to describe it. Describe it. You just got to watch some Giallo. So I'm really excited. Giallo is spelled G-I-A-L-L-O or L-O, but it's G-I-A-L-L-O, Giallo. And that's basically Italian horror film, Italian slashers. And the in the formula for the Giallo films, it's a, there's normally something going on that's sort of mysterious and sometimes supernatural, but there's also, at the same time, a slasher killing thing or slasher on the loose vibe going on happening on. So you're always getting slasher kills while there's something of a bigger picture going on. If that makes sense. And that's just part of the formula. I love it. And this one looks like it's going to be that way from the trailer. I don't know if they're going to overdub it because it is all in Italian. The trailer I've seen it's in Italian. Obviously there's subtitles, but I would really like it if they did an overdub version. Normally I hate that. Normally, I hate overdub stuff, but for some reason in the Giallo stuff, it just works for me. I'm saying Giallo, like, like if I'm an Italian, Giallo, Giallo, G-I-A-L-L-O, Giallo. You hadn't heard of that before, huh? No, like Suspiria, that's a Giallo film. Um, all of those movies, you know, Deep Red, I said that earlier, but for some reason I'm drawing a blank on some of those. Tenebrae, obviously. Uh, there's one that one that uh, has Donald Pleasance and Jennifer Connelly called Phenomena. And that one, it's okay. It's not, it's not my favorite. And some of them aren't great, but the kills are always awesome. They're always practical effect kills. They really focus on the kills. Like they do close-ups. Sometimes when they do like throat slashings and stuff, they do it like real slow. And it's just like all this blood and it, they really take pride in their on-screen practical effect graphic kills. They love it. It's so over just 
they they relish in it. And that's part of why I like the movies. So anyways, I'm just really excited about Last Matinee. And especially after seeing the trailer, it just, I need a good Giallo film. It's been forever since I've seen one. And this one is obviously the love who's making this is grew up on Giallo films. They love it. So check it out. If you haven't seen this trailer, go check out the trailer for the last matinee. If you're a horror fan and a slasher fan, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Well, moving on still to some horror. And this is something that I kind of wanted to talk about is that recently it's been announced that they're coming out with a Texas chainsaw massacre movie that is taking place right after the original. So they're doing that whole flate that they're doing the whole trendy thing now that everybody's doing and they're erasing all the sequels like Halloween did it. They're racing all the sequels to it. And I feel like there's another movie that just did that. But anyways, it's not something that, Oh, exorcist, I think might be doing that now with their new contract. I don't, I don't necessarily mind that they did it for the Halloween movie. It kind of works. I personally wish they would have kept like part two in there. I even would have been okay with them keeping part like H2O in there and kind of, you still could have made the same movie after all that, I think. But I definitely see why they took out four or five, six, eight and three. Well, three doesn't even connect, but I definitely thought, they did a good job with the 2018 Halloween. Like uh, that to me, that was a good movie. I liked that it picked up and erased a lot of those bullshit sequels. Like I said, I just wish it wouldn't have erased Halloween two, And I would have been okay with them keeping H two O in there. Cause I feel like they could have made the same movie, the 2018 Halloween, the same movie, just maybe adjusted a couple things, but you know, her life still could have gone to hell after H two O because that movie was 22 years ago. I mean, it's crazy to think about, but it was. Well, all that, now that I'm talking about Halloween, I'm I'm actually here to talk about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So, Freddy Alvarez, I don't know if you guys know who Fede Alvarez is, and I'm saying Fede, like F-E-D-E, Fede Alvarez. He's the guy who did the original, he did the Evil Dead remake, which I thought was fantastic. To me, one of the better remakes that's out there. One of the best, that and like the, the it chapter one remake. These two are some of my favorites that have been done. And he, he also did don't breathe and don't breathe is awesome to me. Don't breathe was a super, super surprise hit surprise, enjoyable horror film that I did not see coming. And I know for a fact that that twist at the end when M night Shyamalan was watching this movie, I know he was just like, Oh, yep. I didn't see that. I mean, that this was a full on, M. Night Shyamalan, Eat Your Heart Out twist that was in this movie. Fantastic. I thought it was excellent. Well, he just come out recently talking about the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that they're making, the one that's taking place right after the original, which actually with these movies, I like them all for what they're worth, and we'll talk about that in a second, but I'm glad that they are kind of erasing all the other ones and taking place right after the original, which they've already done that, mind you. I don't know if you guys ever saw, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself, but people are saying now that they're worried about the rumors of this screening. There's been a screening of the new Texas chainsaw massacre movie, which there's no poster or anything yet. We just know the it's taking place after the original and people are worried. They're saying the screenings were bad and they, they were just, he, he basically comes out pretty recent talking about how he was like, um, I'm not sure what movie, these guys are at, but he's like, I I thought it was awesome. He's like, if you could have seen everybody over here, it was amazing. He's like, I would let the studio announce that we played it a couple times. And there was someone online who said it didn't go well. Like, I don't know what screening he was at, but it was amazing. Everybody was like, damn. He's like, you know, when you get a test score and it scores as good as don't breathe two. And then he, then he goes to say, which I think is better than don't breathe one. Whoa. Are you kidding me? So stop for a second. Fede Alvarez, the producer of the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that's taking place after the first one. Like I said, erasing all the ones you see on here, except for the first one, which is this one is going to be the only one that exists. Okay. Same guy, the director who did Evil Dead and who did Don't Breathe. He didn't direct Don't Breathe 2. He's just producing it. 
Now he's saying that this movie, Don't Breathe 2, that he didn't direct is better than the one that he directed. And this is coming from the guy who did Evil Dead remake, which I think is phenomenal. And he's doing the new Texas Chainsaw Rat Massacre continuation from part one. That's got me pumped up. I mean, I think that guy's one of the best horror directors out there right now. And for him to say that, that Don't Breathe 2 is better than Don't Breathe 1, I mean, that's a huge, bold statement. If you guys didn't see Don't Breathe 1, have to go see that. I mean, it's not called Don't Breathe 1. It's just called Don't Breathe. But you have to go see Don't Breathe. I mean, not only is it intense the entire way through, but it's just a phenomenal slasher-esque horror film, but it's also slightly a haunted house film, but there's no supernatural stuff. They're just in this house that's just super creepy. But then, like I said, the twist, I can tell you that there's a twist, and I guarantee you there's no way you're going to see it coming. I can guarantee you you'll, there's no way you'll see this twist coming. It's that good. So the fact that he's saying that Don't Breathe 2 is better than Don't Breathe 1, and he didn't even direct this one, that's just really got me excited. Just really, really waiting to see this movie. And I think it's another one of those things, too. A lot of people were saying, just like the Halloween Kills trailer, like, oh, man, we saw all the kills in the trailer. It's going to get spoiled for us. Like, I don't think that's the case. Same thing with Don't Breathe 2. I don't think that that's the case. I think that we saw some crazy shit. We know what the movie's going to be like. But I think a lot of those kills were just maybe kills that we see at the beginning of the movie or, I mean, I was thinking about, do we get to see sort of a montage of what he's been up to? You know, do we get to see, I love seeing like killing montages. They did that in devil's rejects. And I just love that kind they did it in, in house of a thousand corpses as well. And so if they do something like that with his character, that'd be pretty cool too. But I just don't think that we got spoiled and everything in the trailer. I really don't. I don't think Fede Alvarez would allow that to happen. He's too good of a filmmaker. His movies are too, too good. Like I said, with the twist, at the end of Don't Breathe, I think they know in Don't Breathe 2 they have to do another solid twist just to keep up with that. I'm not, I mean, I haven't talked to anybody in Hollywood that knows that for sure, but that's just my thinking. If I'm a if I'm a producer, like, well, if we're making the sequel to this one that nobody even thought we would make a sequel to, I mean, think about that. Did you guys think they'd ever make a sequel to Don't Breathe? I didn't. Not that I'm, like, unhappy about it, but I just wasn't a movie that warranted a sequel or I even thought one could be made. But Fede Alvarez is saying this one's better than that one. So I'm pumped up. And he's saying that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre continuation of part one is amazing. Now, nothing, nobody knows hardly anything about this and there has been a screener, but that's it. There's no trailer. There's no posters, nothing like that. I haven't really seen many of the people that are in it, but that's good. I don't mind them keeping wraps on it. But some people in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre world, they just think it's silly. They're done with it. Yes, the first one is extremely well regarded. That one is sort of across the board. That one's kind of like Halloween in its own right. It's it's not respond. It's not it's not the first slasher, but it changed the way people could make horror films. It was the first super guerrilla style horror film. I mean, it was just gritty as hell, and people were like, "Man, all right, we can make these type of movies. Well, we're about to start doing it." And a lot of people don't realize the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's very little blood in it. There is some blood, but it's it's very little. And any of the blood you see a lot of the time is on other things like the walls or on the couches or something. But you never see any full-on graphic stab scenes or graphic hood, head cutting off scenes, chainsaw type scenes. When he drops the chainsaw on his own leg, Leatherface does, that's, that's kind of something. But for the most part, it was not that graphic. It's just so well done. And just so it'll almost drive you insane watching it. <laughs> now I know some of you might be like, why would I want to watch that? But it truly, it almost drives you insane because that's how well it done it is. And it puts you in the shoes of this girl and these other characters that are involved with this just terrible situation they've fallen into. And I'm, excited to see Fede Alvarez, how he explores that world. Because if you would have told me somebody's remaking Evil Dead, one, they didn't go the ash route like I thought they would, which was great. They were like, no, we don't need to just try to, you can't, nobody else can play Ash but Bruce Campbell. So they didn't even try to do it. They just avoided it completely, which is perfect. So with this, the Texas Chainsaw deal, that's a world 
that I'm just curious. I think that he's ready for. I think that he's got the mind for it. He understands what needs to be put on the screen to make this franchise come back to life. Because I'm going to go through this here a little bit. It's been it's hard been not the best road for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. In fact, it's kind of regarded as sort of the black sheep of the horror franchises. Like, yeah, Hellraiser and Phantasm, those movies got ridiculous towards the end, but they still kept this strange fan base that's all about it. But the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, because the first one is so great, people are so critical of some of the other ones because the first one is like creed to them as horror fans, you know? So they've gone... Wait, hang on one sec. Uh, as Maniac, you're saying Texas Chainsaw is a masterpiece. Yeah, okay, so there you go. Yeah, it is a masterpiece. So there's so many people that have gone into filmmaking. They've gone into the entertainment industry alone just because of that movie. So I get why people are so hard on all the other ones. I do. But they are fun for what they're worth. Are there some bad ones? Yes, there is. But they're not as bad as the Michael Myers one. And I think that, I don't know, I think because of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies not having any sort of common thread between the films at all, I'd say that the remake and the remake prequel called The Beginning, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning, those were actually, they had a common thread. They felt like they were the same universe, same movies, kind of. I mean, they were both good. Texas Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning is really brutal. I like those a lot. But they did get a little crazy with it. So, but when you have the film like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the first one, well, like I said, was so groundbreaking. People actually went into the film industry because of this movie, and it scared the hell out of people. And some people thought it was real. Like, not you weren't watching something real, but they thought it was based off something that really happened. And it wasn't. It's loosely based off the real killer, Ed Gein, but it wasn't based off of something that really happened. Like, that specifically didn't happen. There was a guy that used to make lamps and shit out of girls' skin and stuff like that, Ed Gein. But as far as, like, that specific situation that went down, nobody, that never really occurred. But it did freak people out, like, hardcore. As Maniac says that he loves the one with Matthew McConaughey. Oh, I'm about to get to that one. Trust me. I love it, too. It's terrible, but I love it. I, I mean, absolutely love watching it. It's a shit show. It's a, it's like an acid trip. Anyway, I'm going to get to it, though. I just thought it'd be fun to talk about Texas Chainsaw Massacre because I I think that that's a, an underrated franchise altogether. And not, you know, I like I said, everybody knows the first one's awesome. Everybody loves the masterpiece of the first one, like as Maniac said. But I think the rest of them are underrated. So it had been 10 years since 1978 and toby hooper is the guy who directed the first one he had been bugged the entire time every year they would bug him do another one dude we need you to do another one but he knew he was like how do i top that even if you do something that's actually super bloody and gory this time there's something that's less scary about the blood and gore unless you have something that's scary and terrifying and frightening before you see any blood and gore like if a movie is like just already scaring you and there's no blood and gore at all and you're terrified and then some blood and gore starts to hit, it's absolutely just almost traumatizing. But when you just start off with a bunch of gore all over the place and it's just you're desensitized to it and you're not scared and it, it tends to take over the entire film. And when people think about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they think gore. I think they do. And a lot of people haven't seen it. I'm talking about, you know, people have never seen it. They're like, oh my God, that's got to be the bloodiest movie ever. And it's like, it's really not. The second one though, when Toby Hooper decided to do the second one, he was like, all right, finally, after the 10 years, he decided he's going to do it. But he's like, I'm going to do it my way. I don't want y'all meddling. I don't want anybody controlling anything. And so in 1988, he ended up making Texas Chainsaw Massacre part two, which was technically connected to the original one, but it was such a departure. It was pretty much a horror comedy. It was awesome, though. I think it's fantastic. I think this is probably between this one and part four are my favorite ones to just rewatch, just put them on and have fun with it. They are so much fun. But this one is still good. They did take time with, they did care about it. I mean, you got the introduction of Bill Mosley as Chop Top. I mean, come on. That's about as good as it gets right there. Now, as Maniac, you're saying it has, it has only one flaw, the first one, and it's the visual for the grandpa. That's my only problem with it. However, it makes it even creepier. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I can see that, but to me, I kind of think it makes it creepier at the time. And I don't know at that point of the movie, I'm so invested that I'm, I'm all right. I'm cool with it. But now what about the grandpa in part two? There he is right there. He was awesome. And I think, but I, they also had a ton of money for part two. So they made it, they just did all this crazy shit with it. Now, Leatherface is definitely more of like a goofball in this. He's not, yes, he's scary because he's running around with a chainsaw and he's got, you know, a, a mask on his head made out of people's skin. But he's not scary like it was in the first one to me. He, it, But again, this whole movie was supposed to be a comedy. And then the main thing is you got Dennis Hopper in it as the 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 main antagonist and he's looking for his daughter. And it's the classic thing where she's the, the radio host and and she's talking online about some stuff and she's hearing, you know, things about the old murders. And then all of a sudden Bill Mosley and all them chop top, they're hearing on it on the radio. So they decided to take over this radio station. It's just nuts. And then they find their huge underground lair that where there's just all these bodies it's built out of bodies. I mean, it's just so over the top that you can't love it. I mean, you can't help but love it. And you're not meant to believe that it's, supposed to be taken seriously at this point like it by the time you're halfway through the movie you're like all right let's just go crazy with this and have fun and for me it works i think it's a lot of fun yeah so as maniac says he's only seen that one once is that the one with the kills in the car on the radio station exactly and what's a lot of people don't know or you might know but the guy in the car at the beginning with there being, you know, the Leatherface and they're driving on beside of him on that truck and Leatherface is on the side of the truck with his chainsaw and he's all, ah, ah, and he cuts that other dude's head off that's driving the other car. That's John Schneider from Smallville. That's uh, Jonathan Kent from Smallville, Clark's dad. Just, or Dukes of Hazzard. You know, he's in Dukes of Hazzard. Anyways, just throwing that out there, a little trivia. But anyways, I thought that was a great. They, they really tried to have some fun with it. They knew they had to go in an opposite direction. And they did something that hadn't been done, and it worked, in my opinion. I thought it was a lot of fun, and it was still gory, too, as hell, but it was like funny gore. Anyways, I just think it's a great movie. Now, moving on to Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 3. This one was directed by a guy named Joe Burr, and he wanted to make the best movie ever. This one's got Viggo Mortensen in it. It's got, um, why am I drawing a blank on the, Ken... Ken Foray in it. He's in he's in all the Rob Zombie movies now. But uh it was just really a good attempt. They tried, but the part that doesn't work for this movie is that the ratings board got a hold of it and just took out everything that was remotely sadistic. I'm not even talking about just gore. They took out everything. When you watch this movie, it feels like you're watching a made for TV movie. Not the quality of it, but it there's no it's it's so hardly feeling like a horror film it's just hard to explain because the 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 ratings board just got a hold of it like crazy i still think it's cool for what it's worth and it has some moments that you know some visual moments that are really cool in it but and it's got some funny moments too in it like that one guy that's like don't tell me what i should do if you've seen that movie you know what i'm talking about and then you got a young vigo mortensen in it it's fun has its moments but from what they were trying to do in the beginning of it and what the finalized product was, it was a letdown. To me, it's it's probably the worst one to watch. Like I enjoy re-watching this one the least. It's just something about it that it, there's just something about it that doesn't fully work. And I do think that if it would have been kept the way they could have kept it because the rating board ratings board not tampering, it would have been all right. But there is something about this movie that just doesn't work properly i just don't know what it is even even if they would have had the kills in it i feel like there's something about it that just doesn't it has a polished look to it that just doesn't work for me let's see um oh whoa that is blasphemy sir blasphemy as maniac says he feels like west craven's new nightmare feels like a tv movie it's a 90s movie it's straight up 90s horror i don't know about tv movie but, mm. oh, yeah, that Leatherface poster is good, though, right? Yeah. And, and look, I own it. I have, the, I have it on Blu-ray. I don't, I don't dislike the movie because I love these kind of movies. But I do think that it's, it's the worst one in the series, my opinion. But then 
we got something that just the gods blessed us when we got this one. And this is a movie that is the epitome of being so ridiculous and so over the top that it's awesome. This is to me, this is the Aquaman of the Texas Frank, Texas uh, Chainsaw franchise. One, you got, and this movie was made probably four years before it was actually released. And it was only released because Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger were starting to become famous. They both did this movie really early in their careers. And look, the acting is, the acting by them two is great. The acting by Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey is awesome. But the acting by everybody else and the quality of the film itself is pretty bad. It is definitely B-movie horror. But it is also, I, I think that, it's the black sheep. People call it that. I would say that part three is the black sheep personally, but because this one is so much fun to watch Matthew McConaughey role of a lifetime. I mean, if somebody's going to, if somebody asked me, Hey, what's the best two roles Matthew McConaughey's ever done in your opinion, I'd say true detective and Texas Chainsaw Massacre next generation. To me, those are the best two roles he's ever done. He, he is you you can't look away from the screen. Like if you see him once in that movie, you're watching the rest of the movie because he's so much fun to watch. As Maniac says, he found this before he, the Texas Chainsaw, the first one. That hey, you know, a lot of people did, depending on when you were born. And this one wasn't one. I don't think that this one even went to the theater either. I think it was actually a straight to DVD or straight. Excuse me, back then straight to video release, because this was something that was shelved. They weren't going to put this out. And it's actually written and directed by Ken Hinkle. That's the guy who co-wrote Texas Chainsaw Massacre with Toby Hooper. And he was like one of the producers. And he had been involved with the franchise for a long time. But this is, was his opportunity to make another one, to make his version. And look, awesome moments here and there. There's a lot of fun, fun moments. I love it. Um, it's not, it is a B movie straight up. But that's part of the charm of the film, in my opinion. I think that that's part of what makes it work. And Leatherface is in the movie. And look at this. Leatherface dresses up like, like a girl and like puts on wigs and stuff. It's weird. It does all kinds of stuff. I mean, it still has the tuxedo leather face as well, but it's just very strange. Um, Matt McConaughey has this like weird leg brace with this remote control and everything. It's just whack. But he is crazy. And definitely, like I said, between him and Renee Zellweger, worth watching that movie alone. And as soon as you might be watching the movie and be like, what is this? As soon as McConaughey comes on the screen, I guarantee you, you'll be like, well, I'm watching the rest of this just because of him. That's how much fun he is in that movie. And he has to know that that movie was just, he has to know how crazy he was in that. I'd be surprised if that didn't get him more roles, you know? Anyways, after that one, it, that, because that was just, a bomb. I mean, it wasn't even released in the theaters, I don't think, but I mean, it just, it wasn't well received at all. People realized it was crazy acting, but it just wasn't, it wasn't well received. So it had been a long time, been a long time. And then they came out with these and pretty much, I think they came out either back to back, like one year after the other, or it maybe it was two years, but I think it was one year. But the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake with Jessica Biel, directed by Marcus Nispel, or N Nispel, I think that one's fantastic. I think that one's great. I think the beginning was even scarier. I really do. I think it was it just terrifying. Some of the stuff that, I mean, it gets almost too dark at certain moments, like to where you're not having any fun because it's like, God, this is brutal. Thought it was great. It was very much early 2000s, but it was some of the best of the early 2000s films. I did like them. But I'm glad they didn't go any further with that. I thought it was a cool little prequel setting. I actually would have been okay with just the one remake. But then they make this prequel to the remake. And it worked. It really did. But I was I was already okay with just the remake. Now, a lot of people don't like this one. Texas Chainsaw 3D. Now it's just Texas Chainsaw. Now, this is the one originally that they were. it was supposed to take place right after the original film it, and it takes place in the seventies and it, it's right after that original film. So I'm not sure how much I dig it as far as connecting that way. Cause it doesn't feel like it should be connected. However, I did like the movie. I think the movie's in 
a lot of fun. I think the leather phase works. I think the kill scenes are brutal. I think it's directed really well, actually. But them doing that whole taking place after the first one, I just, I'm not sure that they had a, the, the nail on it well enough to make that movie. Bill Mosley's in the beginning of it playing a little character. He plays one of the Hewitts, one of the Sawyers. And there's an opening cool scene that shows like a, it's like a super prequel, even to the original film, but it's like a prequel scene, not a prequel movie. Just that scene is a prequel. That's really cool. All that's cool. How it like connects, but the fact that they made this one cut out the other movies, I just, like I said, I don't know if these filmmakers were ready to do that with this film yet. They just didn't quite have it. But then after this, they released a movie called Leatherface, which is like the, the least Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie of them all. And it's about Leatherface from a baby until he grows up and becomes the chainsaw-wielding maniac. Now, it was good. It's a really good movie, but it's you're, it's not a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. I mean, a lot of the movie takes place in the 50s, and you're following these kids that are on the run. And it just feels kind of, yeah, there's some gruesome moments, but it feels kind of like a Bonnie and Clyde movie in moments. And it slowly gets to the horrific moments and the stuff and then it does get there but it it is the least texas chainsaw massacre feeling movie out there i liked this one as its own to me leatherface should have been its own movie it should have been its own thing it shouldn't have tried to connect to any other thing i think that they were trying i think every time they build these movies they try to build they're trying to start a franchise over again like i don't think they had any plan with leatherface to be like hey let's just make this cool one shot movie no, they always have a plan to reboost the franchise. They did with Texas Chainsaw 3D. I mean, they've said this. They're always trying to make it go further. So I, I wish they would have just, because they leave you like a cliffhanger thing at the end. I wish they would have just kept this like a one-shot movie, like this is how Leatherface developed. That's it. I think it's good in its own right like that, but it is the least Texas Chainsaw Massacre film out there. So I just wanted to talk about those. I think they're all really worth watching. Um, Leatherface is a good movie. It's just not, it's not got that insanity vibe to it. Like part one does part two, even being a comedy, it is got that insanity vibe. Part three was just tamed down too much. That's my biggest complaint. It's just, just fully tamed down and just doesn't feel like something works. Right. Part four is a ton of fun. It's crazy as hell. I totally recommend that one for a B movie, but it's still a ton of fun to watch. It never gets old. In my opinion, the Texas chainsaw, remake and the beginning one really good probably the darkest ones but they're really good for what they were i thought 3d was a lot of fun um i think it gets a bad rap but again i don't think that they were doing well with that whole taking place after the first movie so hopefully this new one they get it right they make something that's on the equivalent of like the 2018 halloween and if they do that i'm really pumped up i hope that that's the route they go because there's a very good chance they can mess it up but with Fede Alvarez doing it, I don't think that's a possibility. I think he knows what he's doing. Um, and yes, Platinum Dunes did get a hold of that franchise as Maniac. There, in fact, Platinum Dunes, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the first one they did. Now, this new one, I don't think it's Platinum Dunes anymore. I think they lost it. Uh, but the original remake with Jessica Biel was Platinum Dunes. And that was the first horror remake they did as a production company. So guys, real quick before I end, I was just going to talk about one more thing about Amazon. The deal with Amazon, they say, is in peril because these people are coming out now. And let me find this uh, article. But these this group right now, a group of four major labor union representing almost four million workers, are urging the Federal Trade Commission to block Amazon's proposed acquisition of MGM saying that it's going to be too much of a, it's going to be a monopoly of the entertainment industry basically is what they're saying. They're saying that this is going to take over. So they're going to control so much of the, the entertainment industry that it's not going to allow for healthy competition. And that is sort of a creed in the way businesses work. So business because businesses have the opportunity to flourish against each other. But when you have something taking over everything, it sort of ruins opportunities for other small people. And that's sort of what these people are trying to raise with Amazon. Now, does Amazon own a lot? I mean, does MGM own a lot? Look, they own James Bond. And this is what I was going to bring up. And this is why I don't think that people have a lot to worry about with this. I think that 
people should understand that they're going to give a lot more creative freedom and licensing to these pre-existing franchises. So they own James Bond. I mean, I think everybody knows that. And that's MGM's claim to frame, claim to frame, claim to fame. That's exactly, that's what their biggest, that's what they're known for. That's what they spend the most money on when they make movies is their Bond films. But they still have a lot more than just James Bond. The Handmaid's Tale. That's a big thing for them. And that's a pretty successful show. So they're not, their franchises aren't franchises of the Marvel stature or of the Warner Brothers DC stature, things like that. But their franchises are worth stuff. MGM owns the Rocky franchise. They own Fargo, which is a really successful show on, on TV right now. I mean, the Legally Blonde franchise, which they're about to make a third one of that. They own that. Vikings show I didn't really care for all that much. The Hannibal, the, the, the whole Hannibal IP, Silence of the Lambs, all that stuff. That is MGM. So they, RoboCop. Oh, RoboCop, MGM. So they have all these IPs that they, it's worth them buying this for, but I don't think it, people have to worry about them buying these IPs that are just all of a sudden going to dominate. I think that what Amazon and where they're going to win this battle and not going to get shut down from the deal is I think that they are going to give more license to these IPs and bring them back and more, have fun with them. More, more RoboCop stuff, more Creed stuff, not more Rocky stuff, but Creed stuff because Creed's a part of the Rocky franchise and obviously more Bond. <laughs> I'm not saying I want to see Bond TV shows on Amazon, but it is it is a really cool thing to have the Amazon money to make Bond movies now. Like there's essentially nothing they can't do. And Amazon, I think, is being smart with the way they're doing stuff, especially with this Lord of the Rings deal and all that. I'm just not so, so worried about it. And I'm, I'm confident that they're going to keep the deal. I, I think the deal is going to go through. <laughs> that's funny. I'm not going to read that comment because I don't want to put you under the bus, but that is pretty funny. They are doing different double O agents. Uh, they did say that. I'm, I'm just hoping they don't replace the character of James Bond with like switching it completely to the woman thing. Now I'm not, a, I'm all about woman agents. I just want the character of James Bond to remain. That's it. Make a ton of movies with double O six agents, double O eight, whatever. Make them all women. I'm all great about it. Totally cool with it. I, I support it. Just don't change James Bond. He's James. He's my dude. I love that. I just don't want them to change that character. That's my only thing. And I don't, I don't think that they will. I think they're just going to add characters. But, and like I said, I think that the IPs they own, I don't think they have to worry about them coming in Amazon and all of a sudden it's like Amazon dominates. They own everything. Amazon doesn't own a ton of IPs anyways. They're just trying to get IPs. I don't think that they're trying to dominate. It's kind of like when Fox, when Disney was trying to buy Fox Sports. That's them trying to buy another network that's already existing and people are Fox fans. When they bought 20th Century Fox, they were just buying IPs. Fox Sports and 20th Century Fox were two different things. When they're buying 20th Century Fox, they're buying franchises so they can use those franchises. That's cool. I understand them buying Fox and not Fox News. I understand them not being able to, excuse me, Fox Sports. I understand them not being able to do that because Disney owns ESPN. So now you're you're buying two competitive networks that people are like, you're either a Fox Sports guy or you're an ESPN guy. You know what I'm saying? There's nobody that's like, I only watch 20th Century Fox movies. No, they watch any movie depending on who's in it and what it's about. It doesn't, they don't care about the studios, but when it comes to sports networks, a lot of people do. And I, I understand that Disney thing, why they weren't allowed to buy Fox sports. I don't understand this argument about Amazon not being able to buy MGM. Like I said, all they're wanting to do is buy properties. They're wanting to buy IP franchises. That's it. They got Jack Ryan, all that stuff. So, I think they'll get it. And these people trying to stop them from doing it. And in my opinion, they're just being ridiculous. But with that being said, guys, that's all I got for y'all today. Thank y'all so much for tuning in for another one. I really appreciate y'all always joining in. And if you weren't able to join the live show and you weren't able to comment or anything like that, please feel free to always send me something to brassworldbobby at gmail.com if you want me to talk about it. Like I said, I do want to get involved with the community more and just get that bounce back going. So hit it up. And like I said, thank you so much for clicking on this to watch it. I appreciate the four or five, one person that did it. And if you haven't done so already, check out all my other reviews on my channel, my hot, fresh popcorn reviews. Those are solid. 
I'm all about just talking about sometimes new movies. Sometimes I'll talk about old movies. Sometimes I'll go on a run and just do like a series of stuff. But check them out. They're all really cool. A lot of edited stuff, a lot of fun. And if you haven't done so already too, hit that subscribe button so you can help us make it to the top. And as always, guys, if life gives you lemons, make some hot, fresh popcorns. And I'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace.